Welcoming comments will be very, very brief. At least for me, they'll be very, very brief. We want to allow enough time both for the panelists' presentations, and we know that all the panelists will be very conscious of time, um, and, but particularly for time for Q&A. The problem with, with some of these meetings is that even you have a good panel and that there's not enough time for the Q&A. I want to welcome everybody uh, to Georgetown and to uh, the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies program today. Um, I came back from a talk yesterday out of town and stepped off the plane and the, uh, the person for the airline opened the door and said, welcome to Siberia. So for those of you who have uh, come from overseas, welcome to Siberia. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we've run into is that one of our panelists from Georgia could not make it because there's a state of emergency there and all flights are canceled, etc. So for uh, some, it's as difficult to get here from Georgia as it is from certain countries. Um, late December 2010 and January Feb uh, and February 2011 were watershed moments. The toppling of Ben Ali and Mubarak stunned many both within their societies as well as in the region and certainly in the West. And one saw what looked like a ripple effect, many presuming that it would be a wave of democracy, others depending, uh, uh, others, uh, rulers uh, in the region worrying about that wave of democracy. In many ways, it challenged the conventional wisdom in questions that had been floating around for a long time. Is there something about Arab culture and Islam uh, that uh, is the cause for the democracy deficit? Um, is it that Islam and Arab culture are incompatible uh, with democracy? Uh, all of those questions that had been around for a long time. In October 2011, uh, the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding held a conference, co-sponsored a conference in Istanbul. And at that conference were uh, many, uh, not many, but representatives of those who were uh, from Tunisia and Egypt and had been involved in the uprisings uh, of all shades, youth, secularists, uh, Islamist uh, uh, leaders um, from Anahta, from the FJP, but even from other countries like Libya and Syria. However different the concerns and the debates, there were two significant questions that emerged as a common concern. One was, what would the reactions be of the remnants of the regime, of the deep state? Uh, more than one person stood up and said, well, you know, in previous revolutions, uh, usually after the revolution, um, those who were defeated were either driven out, imprisoned, you know, etc. But here you still had the structures within, the security, the police, the military, the bureaucracy, the judiciary, which had been part of uh, the uh, previous uh, government. But the other major concern was the U.S. and the EU, and that kept up coming on regularly. Do you think the U.S. and the EU can really uh, accept this kind of change uh, that is taking place? Will they be supportive of, uh, as it were, more independent governments uh, uh, that, uh, that they have less uh, of a partnership with uh, than they had with a Ben Ali or a Mubarak? And then with the elections, and for some the surprise that Islamists did as well as they did, uh, the FJP uh, in Egypt and Anahta in Tunisia, that added to the questions uh, that emerged about the future, about the responses within the region of different governments, as well as the responses of Western governments. Fast forward, we now see a situation where after multiple elections uh, in Egypt, we have mass protest, a coup, and uh, uh, a change in significantly in what looked like uh, the direction uh, that was occurring in the country with questions being asked about is this a restoration of uh, democracy um, or is it an unraveling of uh, hopes for democracy. In Tunisia, although there have been problems, we've seen a different path uh, signaled mo most recently this week with the signing, or just last week I guess, uh, the signing of a, a new constitution. Um, and uh, 
with difficulty, a multi-party uh, system. Today we'll be uh, f- uh, pursuing a number of themes, and you have them there uh, in your notes if you don't have it, uh, just to give you a sense of where we want to go with this. Critical stages of the Egyptian revolution was the coup inevitable, the current status of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, the role of youth movements and NGOs after the coup, and then restoration of democracy and the rule of law, the role of pro-democracy groups and the international community. Um, so I, I, I'd again like to thank you. I'd particularly like to thank our presenters, many of whom have had to uh, uh, go through a, a great uh, deal of um, uh, effort in order to be here. And I'd like now to introduce Jonathan Brown, um, who has played a major role in putting this uh, conference together, uh, in leading our team. He and Kevin Pryan, who's behind the camera here, uh, as well as uh, other members of the center, but particularly the two of them, uh, have brought this about. You will notice that Jonathan's hair is turning slightly gray, and that's just my way of saying that's why I'm actually very young. But if you do 20 years with this center, that's what happens. Um, thank you very much for coming. Welcome, everybody, to Georgetown. Um, I, uh, this has been really a challenging conference to put together. Um, not only because it's a big logistical effort, because the issue is, uh, is, is a very controversial one. I wanted to, first of all, uh, extend my deep and sincere uh, thanks to the staff at the uh, Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and the Center for Contempor- Contemporary Arab Studies. They put in a huge, huge, huge amount of effort, and everything that happened really was as a result of their labor. Uh, Christine Kidwell, our um, associate director, Kevin Prine, Jessica Chillen, Andrea Pettis, and then the staff at CCAS uh, under the direction of Osama Abi Mirshad. There's also some, some changes to the program because one of the, the challenges we had in putting this together was, was getting visas for all the guests coming from overseas. That's a, a big challenge. If you're trying to get a visa for yourself, it's really hard if you're trying to get a visa for a lot of people. And... Uh, we actually had to postpone the conference once because we just did not have enough people who'd gotten their visas. Uh, ultimately, one person was not, the visa did not come in time. Unfortunately, General Adel, Adel Suleiman from a uh, retired Egyptian army general was not able to come. Also, uh, Abdel Fattah Mahdi from University of Alexandria is not able to join us from Egypt. And finally, as Dr. Esposito mentioned, uh, Dr. Kerry Wickham from Emory University is also not able to join us because of the, the, um, the air travel situation. But she did send her paper, and she's very eager to have her paper read by uh, people who attend the conference. So it will be up on the, the website, and we'll, we'll announce it when it comes time for her panel. And uh, I think that that's pretty much it, except to say that we'll be, uh, and Dr. Bull will explain this more, we'll be taking Q&A from uh, emails and written form. And this is just to because uh, this is a really tight schedule, and um, in order to give the speakers a maximum amount of time to answer questions, we need to try and prevent the, what sometimes happens, which is questions turn into lengthy comments, and that eats up a lot of time. So this is just for the, for the sake of efficiency. And we know this is a controversial issue, and all the moderators have been instructed to really give full, uh, you know, to give a full representation to the range of opinion on the issue. So uh, without further ado, we can start our first panel. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to uh, an excellent day. Welcome again, and I want to again express uh, gratitude for the people who have done all the hard work on organizing this conference and for all of you who are up bright and early on our, uh, I don't call it our Siberian weather, having grown up in Minnesota, I think this is just sort of a nice, quiet homecoming of relatively warm weather. I mean, I was talking with my sister last night and the real air temperature at that point was something like 12 degrees below zero. And her, her wind chill factor was something like 35, minus 35. But at any rate, welcome. And uh, one of the difficulties 
of asking an old geezer to be the beginner in something like this is that the temptation is to look at the subject from a long-term historical perspective. I first went to Egypt in the middle of the time of the United Arab Republic. I marched in Tahrir Square uh, when President Gamal Abdel Nasser came home from the United Nations. And one of the curious things it was, uh, that I experiences that I had as I looked at the final form of the conference was to say, you know, when I came back to Harvard in 1961 after having been there, we could have had this conference. All of the title, you know, Islam and the Struggle for Democracy. And then I look at the, the title of our first panel, Critical Stages in the Egyptian Revolution. Was the coup inevitable? You know, uh, well, there, there were people there that could remember Farouk, uh, you know, and was that coup inevitable, uh, and, and so on. And as we look, uh, I am reminded of a, something that my colleague John Esposito very regularly says, you know, that this is a very, com we're dealing with very complicated subjects, and yet at the same time, it's a very simple problem. Because the questions that people asked when we first started our professional lives, mine professional life longer, I mean, I don't have quite so much gray hair as John, but that's because he works harder and I get to relax. Um, but the questions, uh, what is the relationship between Islam and democracy? What kind of reform can Muslim activists be involved in if they want to transform society? All of these questions were questions that were asked more than 50 years ago when I was a graduate student. And I think that we need not to get so presentist as we look at things, uh, as to remember that this fits in, this is in a broader framework uh, of experience as we look forward to uh, today's discussions and as especially as we look forward to the future of Egypt. I have the pleasure of moderating this panel uh, I'm sorry that we don't have uh, Carrie Wickham with us, uh, but, uh, and that will not give our speakers extra time. Um, uh, we, have, uh, we have all been asked to not talk for longer, or they've been asked to not talk for longer than 15 minutes, and so I will give them a two-minute warning, which means they'll talk for at least five minutes more. Um, but uh, we, will have, uh, we will have presentations from three people that I'm looking very much forward to hearing, and therefore I will not talk much more. Uh, Michelle Dunn is part of the family. She's one of us. She, she and actually in terms of remembering Nasser, uh, you did your dissertation on Nasser's, Nasser's political rhetoric, right? And, Mubarak. Well, you know, I wasn't. You, you, your, 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 your grandmother. Your grandmother was with me. You see, but, but Michelle is currently senior associate at Carnegie's Middle East program, uh, where she has just come back to Carnegie after being the founding director of the Rafik Hariri Center for Middle East for the Middle East of the Atlantic Council. Um, Wail Hadara uh, brings us practical experience of having uh, been an advisor to former president or president, um, depending on your views, uh, President uh, Mohamed Morsi during his election campaign and then an advisor during his year as president. Uh, and we look forward to his work. Uh, and then Mohamed al-Masri brings to us a specialty in the media and in the relationship, well, you know, I can read you the uh, Dr. Al-Masri is a political and media analyst appearing regularly on international television news networks uh, and talking in terms of the sociology of the news, Arab press systems, and so on. Now, I will not introduce each of them. Uh, when one of them finishes, the, the next person will come up, uh, and so we will just move forward. My last duty is to remind you of the mildly complicated but I think efficient uh, methodology. Uh, for asking questions and answers. For questions, uh, we ask you to write your questions. There's a little table uh, at, the, at the end of this center aisle. Uh, none of us will mind if you've got a question that 
pops into your mind while we're talking, none of us will mind if you get up and go back and get that piece of paper and write the question. Uh, I have the task of choosing which questions. And what I would remind you of is that the best question is a short question. And there may be a brilliant question that agrees totally with my political position, but if it's longer than two sentences, that probably will not get asked in favor of a question about something that implies a total disagreement with my position, but can be read in one sentence. Um, the other alternative uh, is for uh, to submit by email. Now that we're in this uh, enormous Wi-Fi world. I can't guarantee that the national, uh, the NSA won't know your questions, um, but uh, there is an address. Do we? I can't see it from here. Is there? Uh, there will be an email address, uh, and for questions submitted by email, uh, there's a temporary email address to send questions throughout the presentation. And I have a laptop here. Uh, one of the disadvantages of asking somebody of my generation is that I may or may not be absolutely correct in getting your questions, uh, but the laptop here is set up so that I can read and see your email questions as well. well welcome again, and I turn now the platform over to uh, Dr. Dunn. Good morning. Um, thank you, Professor Vol, and thank you, Professor Esposito, for uh, inviting me to be with you today. Um, on this panel, I'm, I'm put in sort of a peculiar situation, I think. You know, I, uh, I'm an American, I'm a foreign observer, foreign analyst of Egypt, and yet I've been asked in a way to uh, critique the actions of, of Egyptian players in the uh, on the scene, and uh, I, I'm more in the habit of critiquing the policies of my own government, but I will dutifully do what I've been asked to do with all humility. Uh, and, you know, understanding that I'm in the presence here of people who were participants who know a lot more than I know about uh, what actually happened in Egypt over the last couple of years. Uh, so I ask your forgiveness for any, uh, any mistakes I make. <clears throat> I'm going to stand back a little bit and give you my observations uh, about why, why I think, as someone who watches Egypt, why I think things have turned out the way they have uh, in Egypt over the last few years. Um, and I would say, um, to me, it all comes down to um, a failure to build consensus among Egyptians about where Egypt was going to go after the removal of uh, President Mubarak. One thing that was very notable, I think, about the, um, of course, we all know about the leaderless character of the, the Egyptian revolution, like the other Arab revolutions. And uh, we know that Egyptians in demonstrating and so forth, they knew what they didn't want Right? They did not want a continuation of the, this uh, political stagnation, the corruption, the human rights abuses, uh, the uh, concentration of economic benefits in the hands of very few, and so forth. In terms of what they did want, the slogans, uh, there were common slogans, but as we know, they were relatively vague slogans. Uh, bread, freedom, social justice, dignity. These are important and compelling slogans. But the question is, uh, you know, after the actual removal of Mubarak, how to translate those things into a plan for moving forward. And uh, that would have taken a lot of work, a lot of uh, conferring among uh, different political and social forces and so forth in Egypt. Um, and that didn't really happen. I think that's a very strong contrast with Tunisia. Now, we know Egypt and Tunisia are two very different countries, and they're different in size and complexity and balance of political forces and all those things. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not saying they're identical, but I, I do find it striking that in Tunisia, uh, of course, the army did take power from Ben Ali. Well, the army was the one who stepped in and deposed uh, President Ben Ali, but then the army 
relinquished political power, turned it over to civilians and said, you work it out. And it wasn't the case that, that, that Tunisia under Ben Ali had you know, strong political leaders and well-formed political parties. No, it was a little bit of a chaotic situation, right? In the, in the months following Ben Ali, they held all these large round tables and so forth, but they did work something out. They did work out a consensus on where the country was going to go. Uh, and that consensus has held uh, amidst amidst many challenges. But as we now they know now, they've now uh, passed a very important milestone of agreeing on uh, and passing a constitution and moving on now to elections. Now, uh, as we know, this is not what happened in Egypt, right? In Egypt, uh, the military, of course, held on to power after Mubarak and, and the, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the SCAF, explicitly um, governed the country for uh, quite a while after the removal of Mubarak. Um, now, the way it looks to me is that in Egypt you had these two large political forces, right? You had the, the military and the state and so forth as a, a very large, powerful political force. Because as we know, Egypt did not carry a, did not have a thorough revolution, right? I mean, there was only the top, very top layer of Mubarak and some ministers and so forth who were removed. The rest of the system, the entire military, uh, all of the forces under the, the interior ministry, as well as the massive bureaucracy and so forth remained intact. Uh, and that had the virtue of the time, at the time of, of uh, creating less chaos in the country than would otherwise have been the case and, and, and perhaps less violence. But, uh, but it also meant that, the, that the, the state was largely there and still you know, quite powerful and quite capable of, um, if not completely controlling the situation, at least playing a major role. And then among the political forces outside the government, uh, you know, it was very clear that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was the largest and most powerful and most capable organizationally of all of those forces. So um, it appeared to me that in the, in the time following the removal of uh, Mubarak, uh, of course, the military did not step aside and hand control to civilians, and that there was a tendency for the military to try to work things out primarily with the Brotherhood, primarily with the largest force that was there, uh, in order to, uh, uh, probably in order to minimize the amount of change that would be carried out. But if we look back at the, the experience of the, uh, the march, 2011 constitutional referendum and so forth, it certainly seemed as though there was a tendency for these two large actors, you know, inside the government and outside the government to work things out among the two of them and largely to exclude others. And uh, the military, the SCAF at that time, made what I think were some very fateful decisions that have taken us to where we are now. One of them was to... Uh, prioritize the holding of uh, elections for permanent bodies over the writing of a constitution to elect uh, a, a parliament and a president who would have full terms before a constitution would be written. What Tunisia and, and Libya and other countries often do, in, by contrast, is to elect and inter, in, to elect interim bodies, one or more interim bodies, to govern the country until a new constitution is written and passed, with the understanding that once the new constitution is in place, those interim bodies go away, and you have new elections, and then you then you have people in, in place for four years, or whatever the term will be. That's not what happened in Egypt, and I, I want you to think about that. Now, if that had happened in Egypt, we might not be where we are now, right, because uh, the fact that uh, these permanent bodies were elected and then, uh, you know, I I'm sure you know all the background. I mean, the, the parliament ended up being dissolved and then President Morsi overthrown in a military coup and so forth. And, and some of the arguments involved for doing those things were that, oh, these, these people were, were going to be in office for years to come and, you know, that was problematic and so forth. You know, what, what if there had been interim bodies while a constitution was worked out? I think that might have worked out a lot better. Um, 
the other the other issue is that in the in the early months following the Egyptian revolution and following the uh, removal of Mubarak, of course, you know, that's a very special time in a country, right? Following, you know, a popular revolution, the removal of a longtime leader, there was a period of, of goodwill and of willingness to work together and reach out across the aisle and so forth. Uh, and I feel that was squandered. Uh, and there, there were many things that could have and should have been done at that time. I've already mentioned roundtable process of some kind to work out a consensus on the road forward, but also uh, the beginning, at least, of reform um, of the, the institutions of the state and particularly the coercive apparatus particularly the forces under the interior ministry and so forth. This was not done. This was not done. It was not begun. Not that it could have been done quickly. It's a very big job. But um, I, I feel that that, you, you know, that time, and I, and I don't know what the role uh, of the Brotherhood was in, you know, in agreeing with the military basically to, to minimize the amount of change that would be carried out within the state early on. Early on, I want to note that there there are there are things that you can do in that period of goodwill and willingness of people to cooperate, and I think Egyptians were very willing to see the police and the interior ministry reformed in the first six months or so after the the revolution. Right, very well. The the public would have supported that very much, but it didn't happen, and uh, we see now, you know, the the costs of that. Now, um, I I think you know. There was a sense, I think, that, um, uh, uh, okay, so let, let, me, let me move on now to the point where um, the parliament has been elected uh, and then later dissolved and then President Morsi elected in June of 2012. Um, you know, my, my own experience in, in speaking with people in Egypt, including people within President Morsi's administration and within the Brotherhood at the time, was there was a great deal of confidence that the country was with them and the country was with their project and the street was with them. They had electoral results to show it. Uh, and the army was with them and they had managed to work something out, particularly after August 2012, right, where... Uh, some kind of deal was worked out with General Assisi and others within the SCAF to elevate them, put aside Tantawi, cancel the political powers that the SCAF had uh, given itself through the, the constitutional declaration passed at the time that Morsi was elected and so forth. Um, there was a great deal of confidence in a sense, frankly, that they didn't need to work with the other political forces, um, a sense that the the other political forces, the secular political parties and everything, really didn't count for much, uh, didn't command much public support, really were not very useful. And so uh, I think, you know, there, there were... Uh, there was an opportunity to reach across the aisle, so to speak, and build a broader coalition, and it didn't happen. Okay, uh, again, in the first, I would say certainly in the first uh, four or five months after President Morrissey was elected, there was another sort of period of goodwill and willingness to give him a chance and give the Brotherhood a chance and, well, let's work together. And, you know, even people who were very unhappy with his uh, uh, election said, well, okay, but that's what happened, so let's give this a chance and so forth. Uh, again, I feel that was another period that perhaps was, was squandered. You know, there was the uh, and and that particularly became clear with the constitutional uh, declaration in November and then the process after that in December of passing the Constitution, which, of course, was extremely controversial and, and I feel very uh, problematic uh, and really was a mistake. It's a, it, it, it's a, it was a mistake then. I feel it's a mistake again now with the new Constitution to try to... Um, Force through a constitution over the objections of a large segment of the society. Um, so, um, and and this is a, a recurring problem too. I feel that the, the Brotherhood felt this when they were in power, and now we hear it from the military and their allies. The public is with us. The people are with us. We can rely, you know, on the street. Uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, and I, you know, I think of that now when people uh, 
from the military or other, you know, their allies say, oh, well, the public is with us. 80%, 90% they're with us. I, it echoes back in my mind how people from the Brotherhood and the Morsi administration said the same thing a year ago or something like that, right? So I think this, we need to realize this is a very volatile time in Egypt and uh, its turmoil. I think that will go on for some time and um, relying uh, on, you know, the street being with you, I think is, is a dangerous thing. Um, so um, I, I'll just, I'm, I need to uh, end now. I think that um, also I want to say a, a couple of words about the, uh, the other opposition parties, um, the, um, the secular and, uh, and other uh, opposition parties and the Salafi parties and so forth. Um, uh, they also, you know, were, were you know, it, at the beginning, I think, I think during the, the brief tenure of the parliament, there were a number of uh, secular figures, liberal and leftist figures, who were, who were willing, who really tried to work with their um, uh, counterparts from the Freedom and Justice Party. And there actually, I think there were some promising signs that they could work together on some things. The parliament didn't, didn't stay in office long enough for any of that to come to fruition. But they, those that I've talked to had, did express frustrations, that it was very hard to work with people from the FJP who they felt were so confident that the street was behind them that they didn't need to make compromises and so forth. And I, I will also fault the uh, members of, I think, the secular opposition and the secular opposition parties who who supported the coup uh, last July. I think they, they made the mistake of, uh, in this highly charged, highly tense, highly polarized environment of uh, choosing a side, and some of them perhaps thought they would be the eventual beneficiaries in future elections, in parliamentary or presidential elections, in which the FJP would be either uh, either either absent altogether or greatly disadvantaged. We see now that that's very unlikely to be the case, that those secular parties who threw in with the military at the time of the coup now will be uh, pretty excluded pretty much from the presidential election, obviously. General Assisi runs, as now seems to be virtually certain. There, those, no one from those parties will be taking the presidency, and even the parliament. There's a lot of discussion that the parliamentary, uh, the electoral system will be largely on an individual individual candidate rather than a, a party list seats. And once again, those secular parties may find that they don't reap the benefits that they were expecting. Uh, they don't get a majority in parliament or something like that because the uh, if, if the system is chosen that is expected, it will be individual figures, monies, money, old families, et cetera, that will, that will largely control the parliament. So, uh, I, you know, this, this, um, uh, the one last thing I will say is this. In my humble opinion, uh, Egypt will not move forward to build a democracy until some significant combination of Islamist and non-Islamist uh, uh, political and social forces work out a consensus on where the country is to go. Unfortunately, the very bruising experiences of the last couple of years make that a distant prospect right now, but I hope that it will happen someday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I will try and um, be brief. Although I was told never to trust anyone who begins their remarks with that. Um, I will organize my, my, my observations around three headings. The first is, what is this that we're dealing with? Um, and that really relates to the idea that, as we say, that to assess something, situation, you need to have a conception of what it is. Um, and the second is um, who benefits from the situation that we're in today, like any simple crime, and this is not a simple crime. Um, you need to look at who stands to gain from something to understand uh, who's behind this. And finally, what would have been the barriers uh, towards or preventing uh, this from unfolding? Before I, I delve into this, I have two disclaimers. Uh, the first is that I will not, uh, and I never have, and will not suggest in any shape, way, or form that the president's year in office was flawless or faultless. 
um, my standard line to everyone who brings up you know, concerns or issues is to say that for each um, reservation or concern that you have, I, can, I have three, and mine are probably better than yours. Um, so, so that's one disclaimer. The second disclaimer is that I'm not going to attempt to or suggest that there is no polarization in Egypt, that there is uniformity, uh, that all Egyptians really support one faction or the other. There is deep polarization in Egypt. But what I would add is that people are wrong in thinking that this polarization began with the presidency in office or indeed with the revolution. This polar polarization has been building uh, for socioeconomic reasons and, and political reasons over the last 30 years, if not, if not longer. Um, so let's not uh, distill this into, you know, if only the president had done so and so, or if only the FJP had done so and so, we would have been better off. Um, and I'm not at all suggesting that that's what Dr. Don was suggesting, but other people have made those observations. So starting with what are we dealing with here, and, I, and I'm not going to go into this, um, and, and forgive my, my emphatic expressions, but I'm not going to get into this silly discussion around is this a coup, is this a revolution, I think it's, I think we now know what we're dealing with. The question I want to tackle is, was this a largely pre-planned event that took place uh, against uh, or, or because of uh, a group of people who intended this to happen? Or was this a reaction to unfolding events? Uh, for example, the mistakes or the faults of the, of, the, of the performance of the president and his cabinet or Prime Minister Kandil's cabinet over the last uh, year or so? Recognizing that uh, those are not necessarily entirely mutually ex exclusive, but for rhetorical ease, I'll, I'll set them up as being two separate um, uh, extremes. And I would submit to you that what we're dealing with is a pre-planned event, that uh, ever since uh, the street protests of January 25th, 2011 uh, broke out and leading, as we all know, to the uh, removal of Hosni Mubarak, uh, and, and the unfolding events of 2011, that there is a coalition of groups that mobilized with the intent of re-establishing the status quo ante. Uh, and it is as simple as that. What we're dealing with today is an attempt to restore the status quo ante, to return Egypt to before January 25th. And um, when you look at the, the actors, the players, it's pretty obvious who those are. You have institutions, and you have individuals who had a, vest, a vested interest, both economic, social, and frankly, um, you know, related to their very lives in some circumstances, uh, in, in not uh, seeing the revolution move forward, and not seeing a representative form of government uh, move forward, uh, however inclusive or exclusive it might have been, in seeing someone else, whoever that someone else may have been, make the decisions um, around the country. And, um, and that coalition, as one diplomat refers, uh, referred to it as, is a coalition of denial. The only, much like the revolutionary forces of January 25th, the only thing that holds these people together is a desire to not see the Brotherhood uh, make the decisions in, uh, in Egypt. Um, those um, those vested interests, and now we go into sort of who benefits, you know, we can talk about the army, the armed forces, we can talk about the Ministry of the Interior and the security services, which, you know, which are not a small, numerically not a small constituency in Egypt, but there's also the oligarchs, uh, people who've made their fortunes and could only keep their fortunes under particular uh, economic and, and indeed socioeconomic uh, conception of Egypt. Uh, there are regional powers that have been very vociferous and very clear about where they stand vis-a-vis -vis a democratic Egypt. And, of course, there's the international community. Um, just to give you a very simple, you know, and people, again, refer to this idea that we, we as in the presidency, we were too uh, naive or simplistic and we didn't really understand what was going on. And, and I, again, would tell you that on the issue of understanding, nothing is further from the truth. The question is, what do you do with how you understand things? If you look at the armed services, the armed forces, for example, there are three ways in which the armed forces extract uh, privilege for its members. 
Uh, the first is very simple, and that is by taking in a large number of individuals at the bottom and allowing some of those to rise to middle ranks, uh, those individuals will then retire at a relatively young age. In their 40s or their early 50s, they will draw a pension uh, from the army while going on to have a, often a very lucrative second career. Very simple, individual-based uh, level of benefit that affects you know, tens of thousands, if not, if not more. Um, while in service, they have the advantage or the privilege of having uh, essentially free labor uh, in the form of uh, you know, the, the rank and file, uh, who will do everything from uh, be their cooks to their drivers to picking up the kids to um, you know, other, other activities which would otherwise cost you um, quite a bit of money in Egypt. And so there's a certain amount of status afforded by that service. Uh, there's an economic privilege. Uh, we talked about the, the pension, but there's also other benefits like you know, being able to buy uh, residences for a fraction of their free market uh, value and then turning around selling those and pocketing the difference. That's one group of individuals. There's another level of benefit, which is if you actually do rise to the top or near the top, uh, once you retire at your normal age of you know, 60 or whatever, you can expect a very cushy but also very important job as a governor or director of an authority or um, something of the sort. This is what Yazid Asai refers to as the state of retired generals. And then at the very top, uh, you look at uh, a fairly substantial financial benefit that accrues from arms deals and, uh, and, um, and the overall funding of the army. So suggesting or, or saying that if only you know, the FJP and the opposition could sort things out, or if we had an interim um, elected body or, or a more meaningful discussion on the Constitution, then this would not have happened, um, I think ignores that the very large vested interest that an institution like the army has. Maybe another example in the oligarchs, there was one particular oligarch who uh, owed the state uh, 35 billion Egyptian pounds out of one single deal. One single deal, the tax owing from, from that deal was 35 billion pounds, five to six billion US dollars. And he went around, and we were aware of this, saying, are they stupid? Don't they realize that I would sacrifice a billion to save the other four or five? I am going to spend a billion dollars to bring down this administration um, and save myself the other four. Why would I deal with them? Uh, by comparison, uh, Sheldon Adelson spent $70 million to try and bring down uh, you know, President Obama in the last elections by supporting Mitt Romney. Um, and you know, whether it was bravado or real, uh, we now know that this particular individual actually did spend quite a lot of money to support um, the, uh, the coup. So again, when you're dealing with vast sums of money, when you're dealing with status, when you're dealing with, uh, with vested interests of this magnitude, I think, uh, it's, you know, uh, if, I were, if I was the person holding these things, I would not let them go down. I would not go down without a fight. I would not stand to lose them without, uh, without fighting back. So for all of those reasons and other reasons, I would submit to you that what we're dealing with today is a pre-planned uh, set of events or a course of action rather than simply a reaction to the perceived failures of the Morsi administration. The um, last question I want to address is, well, what are the barriers? What could have prevented this? And I would, um, I would submit that there are three barriers, three main primary barriers that would have uh, discouraged the actors, the MOI, Ministry of the Interior, the police, the army, etc., from embarking on this course of action. One is that they would have to perpetrate a level of violence that is unprecedented in Egyptian history uh, to, uh, to put the genie back in the bottle, that uh, any objective reader of Egyptian um, society post-February 2011 would understand that people will simply not take this lying down. And so the level of violence that they would have to perpetrate uh, would be prohibitive. The second is that to maintain their hold on power after that initial violent phase, they would, they would have to reintroduce a level of repressiveness uh, 
uh, that again is unprecedented, certainly not where Mubarak found himself in the 2000s, where he could juggle this um, pseudo-democratic, pseudo-freedom of, a, of speech type society. And then finally, um, the, uh, the level of violence and the level of repression and the hijacking of a, of a clearly democratic choice uh, in Egypt would um, rally the, inter or at least risk severe um, censure from the international community and from Egypt's primary partners, namely the United States and the European Union. Now, I could be daft and go into um, those three uh, uh, barriers, but I would suffice, I think suffices to say that, um, that none of those has proven to be much of a barrier. This regime, post June 30, has killed more people, more Egyptians have died just in the last seven months that have probably died in all of the 30 years of Mubarak, in all of the 30 years of Mubarak. Now, uh, we don't really know how many victims of Mubarak's prisons and torture and whatnot there were, but, uh, but at least in terms of the reported numbers, more people are in prison, more people have died, more people are injured than, uh, than, um, than in the previous 30 years. And the level of violence in terms of events like Rabaa, for example, or Nahda, or Manassa, or the Republican Guard, or October 6th, or even just January 25th, um, is, is previously unknown and unheard of in, in Egypt. And so to say that there is little that they would stop at in terms of violence uh, is an understatement. And we also know both from media reports and other reports that there are individuals uh, within the current uh, junta who believe that the Algerians were too nice uh, in, you know, in the 1990s and did not do enough to eradicate uh, Islamists and that they, would, you know, they are resolved to do a better job. The second issue, which is the issue of repression, I think we're seeing where that's going both with uh, predictable things like closing down Islamist channels and whatnot, uh, but unpredictable and, frankly, um, incomprehensible actions like the prosecution of someone like Dr. Ahmad Shaheen, like the prosecution of someone like Mohammed Fahmi, uh, who is a, you know, the Al Jazeera English uh, bureau chief in, in, in Cairo, and so on. Um, and then the last piece, really, is you know, the, the, the reaction by the international community. Well, I think we all saw where that went. The country, according to Secretary Kerry, is clearly on its way to democracy, and uh, the army intervened to, to restore democracy in the country. In, uh, in his United Nations speech um, last September, President Obama reminded the world that President Morsi failed to govern inclusively, and, uh, and last night in his State of the Union address, the president um, talked at length, um, to be fair, about how repressive and brutal the current regime in Egypt is. Not. Um, so I think, um, you know, they relied uh, on the silence, if not the collusion, of the international community, and, and they got that. So they were right. They will kill people and get away with it. They can repress people, brutalize the country, get away with it. No one will say a beep. And, um, and they'll have the country back. They will, they will successfully reestablish the status quo ante. What they have not factored in is, and frankly, you know, this is part of the generational issue in Egypt, is that there is a generation of young Egyptians today who would rather die than go back to the status quo ante. And they will continue to go out and they will continue to risk death and, and injury uh, until they see their vision of living freely in their own country. Uh, that, is, um, that is very clear now, uh, except for people who don't choose to understand it. I will stop here, um, and I'm sure there will be some um, you know, <laughs> challenge uh, in the question period. I'd be very happy to continue. Thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> thank uh, all of the organizers for inviting me to speak today on what I think is a, a very important element in uh, both the lead up to the events of June 30th and also um, the, events, the events that have followed June 30th, and that is the, the mass media. And really quickly, 
um, for an American audience, I think there's a temptation to want to provide some kind of a direct comparison between the U.S. press and the Egyptian press. And I, I spent the first part of my career examining and researching the American press, and I've spent the last several years on the Egyptian press and the Arab press. And there are some pretty key differences. If you look at the American press, there is a dominant professional ideology. And one of the really, uh, uh, you know, the most dominant aspects of that ideology is this notion of objectivity. Journalists are taught, they're trained to be fair, to be balanced, uh, to be detached, and to try to the best of their abilities to divorce their own personal feelings on issues from their uh, reporting. And all of the research that we have, or most of it, in the United States suggests that journalists really do, by and large, try to be objective. That doesn't mean that the reporting in the United States is perfect. It is not, of course, and as I said, I've spent a lot of my time sort of critiquing the American press performance. But the problems in the U.S. press have to do with uh, structural constraints on news production and also factors associated with the sociology of news work. It's usually not the result, problems are, are usually not the result of sort of intentional biasing. Now, if you look at the, the situation in Egypt, and I wish I had more time to kind of unpack this, but there are a lot of uh, uh, challenges and problems. One is that the education system in general, not just journalism education, but the education system in, in general in Egypt is really uh, kind of in shambles. Uh, there's a great deal of inefficiency. There's a lack of qualification uh, on the part of uh, instructors. Um, you have an emphasis on rote memorization uh, at the expense of understanding and application, right? Curricula, curricula are outdated. So you have a lot of challenges, and a lot of this is documented in the literature on Egypt. In, for journalism, the situation is actually particularly bad. When I was doing my dissertation research in Egypt about five years ago uh, on the Egyptian press, Numerous journalists, uh, you know, who had graduated from Cairo University and Ain Shams University, large universities in Egypt, complained about the quality of their education. Many of them told me they graduated with journalism degrees and had never been taught how to write uh, news stories, how to write proper news stories. And when I started to do my research, I actually spent time at nine different daily newspapers in Egypt nine of the 12 at that time daily newspapers. And at every newspaper I visited, there was something called the desk, a disk in, in Arabic. Um, and the desk was an interesting place. This was a handful, a small handful of journalists who were really well trained and well educated. And all of the news output, all of the journalistic, out, journalistic output would be sent to them so that they could write and rewrite. And I used to ask them at all of the newspapers, how much writing and rewriting do you actually do? And they would tell me oftentimes, we write min awul wagdid, from anew. We have to rewrite news stories. And they said the journalists don't know how to structure a story properly. And they said journalists uh, don't really know how to write in Arabic. So I'm just giving you, I mean, I could talk in a lot more detail about the problems with the, with the education system and the lack of what we call in the, in the literature, the lack of professionalism in Egypt. Really quickly, another, just one other issue that I, think is, that I think is relevant to all of this is that although it's stated that objectivity is important in, the, in Egypt, in, in Egyptian press ideology, just as it is in the United States. What we find in practice is that many journalists perceive themselves to be activists more than watchdogs. And I think this is really important. And this has been documented in some, uh, some of the ethnographic research and some of the interviews that have, that have been done. So this is all just kind of background. Now, if we look at this one-year period, um, and I, you know, again, if there were more time, we could look at the you know, pre-brotherhood period, we could look at the period now, but if we just focus on this one year period in which the, the brotherhood was essentially uh, in control or at least had some control uh, of the country, Mohammed Mursi was the president of the country, we find that uh, 
there were a series of narratives that were developed and that were driven home repeatedly in the Egyptian press. And I happen to believe that these discourses were so powerful that they helped create a lot of the anger and outrage that was directed at the Muslim Brotherhood and they helped uh, create the conditions, they helped create the conditions necessary for these mass protests on June 30th, okay? One of the narratives, one of the discourses was that the Brotherhood was, and Mohammed Morsi in particular, was fundamentally incompetent. And that's really putting it politely. I mean, they were ruining the state. If they stayed in power for four years, Egypt would be no more. That was one powerful uh, narrative. Now, I think we have to be careful with this narrative because as the speakers before me have said, clearly the Brotherhood and Mohammed Morsi made mistakes, in my opinion, and some of the mistakes were significant mistakes, and so some of the reporting, the critical reporting, was warranted. But I argue, and I have argued, that there is a huge disconnect between the failings of the Muslim Brotherhood and Mohammed Morsi on one hand, and the hysterical coverage of the Brotherhood uh, on the other hand. Another narrative that emerged, which was also very powerful, was that the Brotherhood was taking over the state. They were brotherhoodizing the state, in, uh, in Arabic. And I published a paper in which I kind of unpacked this narrative a bit uh, 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 about seven months ago or so. But I, I think this was actually, for the most part, just a myth. Uh, the Brotherhood did not have significant control over any of the major institutions in the country. Even inside government, their role was fairly uh, uh, limited. And so the idea that they were taking over and hijacking the state and that they were going to turn the state into some kind of mini caliphate really was, uh, really was a myth. You find that there were a lot of... Um, you know, just just a lot of rumor mongering in the Egyptian press. Things that we would find here in the United States published in The Onion, or um, maybe The Inquirer, the National Inquirer, were published as serious news stories in Egypt. So we, we find news stories about Mohammed Morsi, uh, his plan to sell the pyramids, for instance. We find news stories about Mohammed Morsi selling, wanting to sell, and having a plan to sell the Suez Canal to, uh, to Qatar. Uh, we had coverage of Mohammed Morsi's son accepting a job, paying him 30,000 Egyptian pounds a month. You know, and I could go on, right? None of these things were based in any, any kind of reality, but they were taken seriously. You could go on to Google today and find news stories in mainstream Egyptian daily newspapers and also uh, mainstream news talk shows that were discussing these issues quite seriously. Okay? You also had the more, yeah, and there were, I mean, there are other examples, but I'm just trying to save time here. Um, you had the more fundamental problem of lack of balance. So you would flip through the channels, for instance, and Egypt is a talk show culture. I think this is really important. At seven o'clock at night, every night in Egypt, people get, they gather around their TVs and they watch news talk shows. It's not like the US where we just have a handful and we can count them on our hand or two hands, the number of talk shows. In Egypt, there are dozens of these talk shows. You have like 30 networks and every network you see talk show after talk show after talk show until like one o'clock in the morning, midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And people are just watching talk shows. And there was literally, in some cases, no attempt at balance on many of these talk shows. There were shows you would flip to, I would flip to Nahar channel, uh, an independent, this is an independent uh, network, and they would have four guests gathered with a, with a host, and all five of them, the host included, saying the same thing. Okay. I was watching on TV, which is another independent network, uh, one evening I was doing a, a pre-reading for a content analysis that I was starting at that time, and I watched for 75 minutes. I watched for 75 minutes, and they had nine consecutive guests on, one after the other, saying exactly the same thing. Basically, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is, are the devils or something like that. Um, but this is the kind of 
balance or, or I should say lack of balance that was very common, okay? There were periods and there were times, I mean, to be fair, where there were brotherhood guests on where they would have an opportunity to give their voice, but these opportunities were frankly few and far between in the independent press. And I think that's really important. The independent news uh, networks are really important because they are the ones who present this ideology of objectivity and balance and they claim to be uh, fair and presenting uh, uh, you know sort of a comprehensive uh, uh, analysis of the day's events. I did some research in the summer of 2013 right before the coup actually colleagues and uh, of mine and I we went out to some Egyptian newspapers and we did some interviews and one of the things that was really kind of shocking to me is that many, you know, some journalists acknowledged to us that they were intentionally biasing uh, the news, which is really from a, just from an educational perspective and a journalistic perspective is pretty shocking, but they acknowledged this for us. They told us that their editors told, uh, told us uh, to, if there was anything positive about the government, about the Morsi government or the Brotherhood, suppress it. And if there's something negative, highlight it. And one journalist at one newspaper actually told us that we were taught by our editor to try to include the Brotherhood in stories that they have nothing to do with, to make them look bad. And he gave us an example that there was an actress who won an award in Alexandria. And it was just, I mean, the Brotherhood had nothing to do with this. But they worked the Brotherhood into the headline. So it said something like, in spite of the Muslim Brotherhood, the actress wins uh, an award, right? <laughs> so um, this, is the, this is the kind of thing we see. Now, if you look at the state-run press, historically the state-run press is a mouthpiece for the government. And there's no question that the state-run press was much more sympathetic to Mohammed Morsi and the Brotherhood than the, the rest of the, the news media. But there was such contempt for the Brotherhood in many of these state institutions, including the media, that I think that whether it was because the Brotherhood wanted a more fair uh, state press or whether they just didn't have control, whatever the reason, I don't know. But even the state-run press wasn't the, t the typical mouthpiece that we see or that we've seen with the Mubarak regime and even now, especially with the, the current uh, military-backed government. Okay? And in, uh, I did a content analysis which is a scientific method that we use in, in journalism and mass communication research. And my research colleague and I, we found that in the state daily, Al Ahram, which is the, the largest daily, uh, state daily newspaper, 77%, uh, excuse me, 76% of the articles that addressed Mohammed Morsi uh, and his, his uh, administration were neutral in tone. And in this analysis, so that's pretty much over, they were overwhelmingly neutral in the way they talked about uh, uh, Morsi and his administration. I used, in this analysis, I used the same coding scheme that I had used in a content analysis in 2008. So this was essentially a replication. In 2008, of course, Mubarak was the president. So just to give you a comparison, in 2008, Al Ahram, their articles, 81%, 81% of the articles were favorable in tone toward the Mubarak uh, uh, administration. I haven't done any research on the current government or CC, but it, I'm, I'm imagining that it's even higher than 81% positive uh, portrayals. So this is some of what we saw during that one year period. Um, in the Q&A, I'd be happy to address other issues like the Islamist media, the you know, uh, other uh, uh, areas of interest uh, to, the, to the audience. But just very quickly, I've been told that I have two minutes left, so I, I am a professor, so I have to use every last second. Um, if you look at that brief, brief period from June 30th to July 3rd, this is also a very significant period in terms of the media. What were the media saying from June 30th to July 3rd? One of, and I don't have time to unpack it in detail, but one of the things that I thought was significant is that we were told by the Egyptian media uh, that the Egyptian nation, Ashab, the nation, had risen up. 
against Mohamed Morsi. And I think this is a really interesting discourse because it implies sort of implicitly that the people on the other side of this debate are not part of the nation, or at least they're not as significant as, as, as the nation, as Shab. If you look at the, the coverage since July 3rd, the coverage has actually gotten uh, more hysterical. Of course, uh, as you all know, the Islamist channels were shut down on July 3rd. And so you have a singular voice now, essentially a singular voice, with very few exceptions in the Egyptian media. The Brotherhood is regularly described as, uh, they're described as Khawana, a treasonous group. They have no loyalty to Egypt in the first place. They're a disloyal group. Um, they are a terrorist group now. And that actually started on, in, in early July, long before they were officially declared a terrorist organization by the government. So overnight in the media, we see the Brotherhood go from an incompetent group uh, uh, you know, taking over the state to a terrorist organization. Um, that's what happened you know, discursively. We also hear rhetoric of... Uh, a cleansing, purification, that the country needs to be purified of these, uh, these political actors. And just to give you, all, and I'll close on this, one of the, I think that these discourses after July 3rd have been very problematic because I think they've been used to dehumanize the brotherhood and they've been used to justify some of the massacres that have taken place. And on On TV, that network that I referenced a few minutes ago, they, sh they were showing video, uh, video footage of the clearing of Rabah, which was described by Human Rights Watch as the largest massacre in modern Egyptian history, massacre of mostly peaceful, unarmed protesters. They were playing footage of that dispersal and playing the music for Rocky, the movie soundtrack for Rocky uh, in the background. So this is the kind of uh, propaganda that we're seeing in Egyptian media, and I'll uh, leave it at that. Thank you.